Hello and welcome to Still Behind the Bench. My name is Adam and on this channel I will attempt to describe the science behind distilling spirits in a more technical way. Hopefully it will whet your appetite to learn more and teach you enough so that you're more self-sufficient. So for this video I'm going to talk about fermentation and there will be a second video on fermentation and nutrient. Before I get started I'd like to note that the terminology I use is specifically aimed at manufacturing spirits. Hopefully by the end of this video series you'll be able to answer what is fermentation, what is needed for a healthy fermentation, and what can cause a stalled fermentation. So let's get started. So what is fermentation? It is an anaerobic process, a process without oxygen, where an organism metabolizes an energy source like a sugar in order to produce ATP and possibly store energy as some other compound. In our case, our yeast is taking in certain sugars and producing ethanol. For the purposes of using that ethanol at a later time under aerobic conditions. We typically never let those aerobic conditions return for the yeast though, as that might cause issues with the wash. Namely, we are worried about an unintended infection or chemical reactions that can alter flavors in unintended ways. However, yeast can ferment in open containers as long as disturbances to that container are kept to a minimum. To limit diffusion of oxygen into the liquid, since most of the yeast we use are called facultative anaerobes, which means they can produce ATP and respirate when oxygen is present, and they can also produce ATP and ferment when there is no oxygen present, but they prefer oxygenated conditions. Yeast can be forced to start fermenting ethanol under aerobic conditions though. I'm not going to go into it in this video, but you can look into overflow metabolism and the crab tree effect if you want to learn more about it. So you can break the yeast ethanol production process into five major steps. Carbon detection and alteration, glycolysis, pyruvate decarboxylation, aldehyde hydrogenation, and then finally ethanol expulsion. So the first step is carbon detection and alteration. This is where the yeast will determine what sources of carbon are present and get itself ready to process that sugar. I mention this step because something special happens when glucose or fructose are detected. If glucose is present, the yeast won't process any other carbon sources until all the glucose is gone. This is called carbon catabolite repression. Specifically, what happens is when the yeast detects glucose, it will produce proteins to prevent genetic expression of other proteins used to process those other sugars. So let's say you make a grain mash and include some sucrose as an adjunct ingredient to increase the alcohol concentration. So you have maltose, maltotriose, and sugar, sucrose, present in that mash. The yeast will release invertase to break that sucrose into glucose and fructose then it'll start processing the, uh, the glucose and leave the fructose, maltose, and maltose triose alone. Then it will do the same thing with the fructose, ignoring the maltose and maltose triose. And it seems that these are the only two sugars that will cause this repressive effect. But it's a good thing to know because it can be a reason why your fermentation is taking longer than you expected. If glucose or fructose is present, the yeast will process those sugars serially, so one after the other, until they're gone, then it will process all other sugars in parallel together. So here is a list of sugars that Saccharomyces cerevisiae is known to ferment. Not all strains or variants of Saccharomyces cerevisiae can ferment all of these sugars, but most can ferment most of these sugars. So now we have a, a pre-step, which might be optional depending on the sugar in question. I call it carbon alteration. This is where the yeast will convert non-glucose sugars into a sugar that can be used in the glycolytic metabolic pathway. To give you two examples of this step, fructose gets turned into a compound called glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate, and galactose gets turned into glucose-6-phosphate. Then they will enter the glycolytic pathway. The second major step is called glycolysis, and this involves the glycolytic pathway. This is where the yeast will take that sugar and push it through a 10-step process in order to turn it into pyruvate. Here you can see an image of the glycolytic pathway. The main reason I'm showing it to you is you can see how complex it is and how it involves quite a number of enzymes, which will be important later. 
Now we have the third major step, pyruvate decarboxylation. This is also where the aerobic-anaerobic divide happens. Under aerobic conditions, that pyruvate would get turned into acetyl coenzyme A and then go into the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle or TCA cycle, for respiration where it creates ATP and releases CO2. And, in, and using that ATP mainly for replicating in a process called budding. This happens when you first introduce the yeast, this aerobic respiratory process, and the yeast will approximately double every 90 minutes or so as it uses up the oxygen. But under anaerobic conditions, when there's no oxygen left, the yeast will get into the last stage of that second step, glycolysis, where pyruvate is being created and then go, oh shit, there's no oxygen. I should store this stuff. Then that pyruvate is decarboxylated via an enzyme called pyruvate decarboxylase and turned into a compound called acetaldehyde. Then we have the fourth major step, aldehyde hydrogenation. The acetaldehyde will meet up with an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, where it is converted into ethanol. This is probably one of the simplest steps. Then we have the last and final step, ethanol expulsion. And this is just simply where the yeast takes that ethanol molecule and pushes it out of the cell into the medium. In our case, that would be the wort or the must. So here is the simplified equation for fermentation of glucose. As you can see, for every one molecule of glucose, you get, you get two molecules of ethanol, two molecules of CO2, and two molecules of water. The other components, ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, PI, which is inorganic phosphate, and ATP is adenosine triphosphate. These are used to transfer energy around within the cell. But that is it for this video on fermentation. In the next video, I'm going to talk to you more about what you need to do and the importance of nutrients. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. Please click like and subscribe if you want to see more. Have a great week.